This is Jeff Mochi with RCR Wireless News, and we're here at the 2011 Wireless Infrastructure Show with Mark Ganzi, who is chairman of PCI and also CEO of Global Tower Partners. Mark, thanks for joining us. No problem, Jeff. Good to be here. Uh, tell us about some of the major themes for this year's show. Well, I think everyone is uh, thinking about, first and foremost, about leasing trends. I think that'll be a big part of um, the show and the commentary I think you'll hear at the panels throughout the show is what is going on with carrier deployments, specifically the speed and the trajectory of 4G deployments around the major carriers. Uh, it's always a big topic, and I think this year's no exception. We're at a pretty exciting inflection point in the industry, and I think you'll see uh, a lot of folks very focused on those trends. I think a secondary trend will be certainly around capital markets. I think that'll be a big theme tomorrow. Uh, you'll see the financial panel and the uh, financial track will have a, a pretty strong attendance. And mostly that'll be in the investor community and the analyst community. I think people want to understand where markets are headed, uh, how this asset class is financed, and given sort of the macro headwinds that face uh, a lot of different industries out there today, I think folks are going to want to understand how our towers uh, looked upon today by the agencies, looked upon by the investors, and uh, what are some of the trends in financing, not only for the big tower companies, but also a big part of this show is the middle market and smaller tower companies. I think a third part will be, uh, inevitably, will be next generation networks. Um, DAS continues to be a big component of our trade association. It continues to be a big part of carrier plans going forward. And I think people continue to be curious about the DAS industry and, and its evolution and its maturation. I would say probably the fourth thing we'll be thinking about is uh, uh, the continued discussion around AT&T and T-Mobile, which is a healthy debate. Um, we saw that today in some of the, some of the kickoff sessions that happened. Uh, at the show, and I think people continue to weigh in on their opinion on what will happen uh, about these two critical customers to this industry. So it's uh, never a dull moment in Towers. Uh, it should be an exciting uh, three or four days here in Dallas. Let's go back to financing for a minute. There seem to be two major themes. You've seen mergers and acquisitions, you've seen new financings, and now you've seen financings to grow internationally. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about what's driving the capital into the international markets, into the DAS markets, and um, why do you think um, uh, tower companies continue to enjoy a favorable financing environment? Well, I think I'd, I'd, I'd bifurcate it into, into two sections. One, international um, continues to be appealing on a variety of fronts. I think there's that vintage risk-reward between um, building and buying towers here in the United States at lower yields versus taking more risk, whether that's sovereign risk or credit risk, and looking outside the United States for tower development opportunities and acquisition opportunities. Certainly the international theater presents a lot of opportunity, as if you look into different theaters like Asia and Latin America, where 3G deployment is just beginning, uh, that presents investors with a very interesting opportunity. Um, higher yields, higher returns, uh, much higher risk. So I think that'll be a real hot topic at the show this year. Um, when we think about uh, financing and, and why folks still continue to back this industry, I think it still offers a, a, a very, very high flight to safety. And I think whether you're a debt investor or whether you're an equity investor, towers do represent a really protected asset class today. And I think that is still true today, despite some of the macro headwinds that we see in Europe and in general um, around global turmoil and financing. Um, DAS continues to be a very intriguing space. Um, it continues to be uh, a part of our uh, ecosystem that evolves, and I think investors are intrigued by it. Uh, carriers need it. Uh, it still continues to be a, uh, an area of concern for wireless operators, whether it's outdoor DAS or indoor DAS. Uh, it is an area where the carriers are spending, percentage-wise, more capex towards DAS than they are towards macro outdoor sites on a percentage basis. So DAS is a real growth area. Um, whenever you have a growth area inside a, a protected asset class or a favored asset class uh, that's emerging, investors have a lot of interest. And so we continue to see a lot of interest in, in private equity investors and institutional investors in DAS opportunities. So for someone who's not in the industry, why is DAS so important to the carriers and enterprise customers? I think DAS is critical because of the user experience. I think if the user experience is jeopardized, where the user experience is subpar. Uh, it traditionally is in the home or uh, in, a, in a fixed base situation where you're in the office or whether you're in a hotel or you're waiting in an airport. Um, that is when the consumer is captive and they want their network to work. So I think investors are 
gravitate to that because they know where DAS nodes are set up are typically venues where you have a captive customer. So for example, a football stadium or an airport or a large convention hotel. Um, these are areas where DAS is needed um, and candidly where the DAS model works. So uh, it's an exciting space, it's an evolving space and um, it's one that, if we're listening carefully to our customers, they need. So earlier you mentioned uh, the evolution of the network as being a key theme this week, and I think one of the topics is optimizing the network. Where do you see Wi-Fi, Femto cells, and DAS fitting in together in the carrier's network? Well, I think they're all unique and in, in individual components to a network. Um, you know, first of all, uh, Wi-Fi in certain situations is a logical handoff from a macro cell site, and if you're a carrier, and you want to extend that coverage into a retail environment uh, or into a consumer-based environment a la Starbucks or Best Buy, uh, it's, it's very little capital spent for enhancing the experience of the customer and possibly selling devices. So I think Wi-Fi continues to be an important component of carrier plans. Uh, Femto cells, um, we continue to be intrigued by how that plays out. I continue to believe that, that Femto cells are, in essence, a glorified amplifier. Um, and in that, what I mean is, is a distinct user that has a coverage issue uh, can use femtocells to solve that issue if they want to keep that carrier as their primary carrier. So I really look at that as, a, as an issue between consumer and carrier. I don't really think that's a particularly a, a, an, an issue that's germane to this industry or this trade association. Uh, I think DAS, as I said earlier, continues to be a very critical, compar a very critical component of our ecosystem. And DAS goes places where macro sites and micro sites can't go. Um, and it continues to be in areas that are very difficult to zone a, an important solution. So I think we believe that, uh, that DAS is A, you know, growing, uh, B, it's an important part of this constituency here, and C, it'll continue to be an area of intrigue for carriers, investors, and for tower companies. Uh, recently, the Conference of Mayors filed comments with the FCC saying that wireless siting and right-of-way management compensation uh, issues were not delaying uh, broadband deployments. Uh, what does PCA, PCI have to say about uh, the tension between um, uh, mayors, municipalities, and the industry as a whole? Well, I think there's, there's two issues there, really, when you think about it. One is a right-of-way access issue, and the other is just general approvals uh, around entitlements. Um, both are time-consuming, right? So when we think about right-of-way approval, um, that is a process that in, in any entitlement situation takes a long time. So there's always going to be a healthy amount of tension between right-of-way approval and, and what we're trying to achieve and what the carriers are trying to achieve, which is um, in that particular instance, our interests are very aligned. I think as it relates to uh, shot clock and the delay under which we experience in municipalities as an industry, and it's not just for the tower companies, I'm talking on behalf of the entire wireless ecosystem, um, that is a healthy tension that is yet to be cured. And I think there will continue to be a, a healthy debate um, about the delays that are caused at the municipal level. Um, the reality is uh, you have zoning boards. Um, they serve a purpose. Uh, some of those boards are mostly or voluntary. They meet very infrequently. Um, and most of the times they're not very well hearsed or uh, versed or uh, educated in wireless siting and what it means to their community, what it does to property values, um, what are the real uh, truths around health effects. So what inevitably happens is that process is delayed. Um, so I, I would expect those comments to come from that constituency base um, and that trade association. I think that makes sense. Um, uh, certainly municipalities do enjoy a great economic benefit from the wireless industry, uh, whether we're filing for a building permit or a variance or whether we're leasing land on their parks uh, or their stadiums uh, or their rooftops. Uh, the municipal authorities have enjoyed a great economic uplift from wireless antenna leasing. Certainly I'm, I'm confident they'd like to see more of that economic benefit going forward. Um, the reality is um, broadband can't wait um, and we need action. Uh, you've seen the numbers around data uptick. You've seen the numbers around what what it means uh, to the user experience if we don't build out these 4G networks in a timely manner. The amount of cell sites that are required are on a factor of two to three X to make these networks optimized and to more importantly make the devices work and perform. So we have a real challenge. 
Um, and the only way we're going to get there is by achieving um, reasonable and commercial time frames around approvals of, uh, of new sites, whether that's amending an existing location, co-location by right, or whether that's um, de novo, a brand new site. Uh, both of those are equally important to this industry and, uh, and more importantly, equally important to the American consumer on how they're going to get broadband going forward. PCI is a uh, av advocacy group for the tower industry. Um, two of the most recent uh, initiatives that you've had are uh, co-location by right and shot clock. Can you maybe give us an update about uh, those two initiatives? Sure. I mean, we continue to be optimistic about legislation on the Hill today um, around co-location by right. Um, we think this is, is, is the cornerstone initiative that PCI has put forth um, in a federal venue uh, since its inception. We think it's, it's the biggest piece of legislation that could positively impact um, not only our trade association, but the entire wireless industry. Uh, so that, hopefully, um, that language will make it into, uh, into an important bill that's coming to the Hill shortly, and, uh, and hopefully we get acceptance. That's our goal. We've been working tirelessly on that, and um, uh, I, I'm hopeful that that comes to fruition. I think shot clock is, is a process. Um, we're going to continue to work with um, the FCC and, uh, and Chairman Janikowski and his staff. They've got a great staff. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in working meetings with them, explaining to them um, the trials and tribulations of, of building new antenna sites, and more importantly, uh, the impact of antenna siting in the National Broadband Stimulus Plan and the National Broadband Initiatives. Ultimately, um, an efficient process of building antenna sites leads to more jobs. And at this point uh, of where we stand as a country, we need to put people to work. And we need to put people to work in, in high quality paying jobs. And, and uh, I believe Shot Clock accelerates that. And I think it stimulates investment activities in wireless. And uh, we think it's, it's uh, also a very important piece of legislation. Uh, that needs to be modified, strengthened, and more importantly, give the federal government uh, uh, the necessary teeth to see that we can move forward into the 4G world. Great. Mark, thanks for your time today. This is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News at the kickoff of the 2011 Wireless Infrastructure Show.